Will it be another strong year for West Virginia football in 2024? Also on today's show, Kansas is going to be going globetrotting in the 2024 football season. Look at what the Jayhawks have coming up this year. This is the Big 12 Watch. I am your host, Josh Neighbors, and also some Big 12 basketball to look at from last night, too. This is the Big 12 Watch. Once again, Josh Neighbors here on Crystal Ball College Football we are part of the 365 Sports Network. You all can find us wherever you get your podcasts. You all can find us on YouTube as well. You guys can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore. You guys can find the show wherever you all get your podcasts, uh, all of those things. YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, five stars in those places if you could. And then the follows at Josh Neighbors underscore and at NWPod365. So we have done the four schedules for the incoming Big 12 schools out of the Pac-12. We have done the four schedules of the second year schools, UCF, Houston, Cincinnati, and uh, let's see, BYU. We have done Oklahoma State schedule. We have done Iowa State schedule. We've done Kansas State schedule. We've done Texas Tech schedule. We have previewed all of those. Two teams we're getting to today that have been near the top of the league, West Virginia, a nine-win season, and the Kansas Jayhawks, also a nine-win season. A look at what these teams have coming up in 2024. Um, I think, think once again, both these teams are pretty fascinating with what they bring back. West Virginia, though, they just saved Neil Brown's job. And so you're wondering, hey, what will the encore be? And what are fans expecting from the Encore? Fan expectations? I think that'll be something fun to tackle with some actual West Virginia fans. Our guy Kuz comes on a whole lot. We'll talk with him about this. Um, we'll talk to other folks too. You know, Mike Kazaza comes on and covers West Virginia, does a great job. Always love talking to him. So I think a conversation about, well, hey, what's West Virginia got coming back and what will that look like and expectations on Neil Brown, that will be uh, a good one. But for West Virginia, after you go nine and four, and it was it was a good nine and four. I think a lot of people, though, let's, let's go back and look at it. Talk about the 2023 West Virginia football season. They mentioned, hey, like how many good teams did you actually beat? Right, Duquesne, no, Pitt, no, Texas Tech, yes, good good, good team, a bowl team. TCU was a five and seven team. UCF was a bowl team. BYU was not very good. Cincinnati and Baylor both not bowl teams. You beat North Carolina, obviously, though. You know, a little, a little bit of a different uh, North Carolina situation right so you were not beating a lot of top teams but but if a team wanted to show in this conference that they were in fact a good team you did have to go through the kansas jayhawks or excuse me the west virginia mountaineers to prove that you were a good team uh you know i think that's 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 kind of the the wrap on them and also and to go back to it look who beat them right penn state good uh houston not so good that was what that was the hail mary though at the end like this could have been a 10 win season for them oklahoma state yes good oklahoma good Right. So, uh, you know, they got beat by a top 20 team, a team ended up the top 20, uh, once again, off a Hail Mary, and then also a top 10 team at the time on the road. So you look at this season you look at what they've got again, they, they have got, and this is why I love their schedule. Uh, you know, I have a lot of fun with their schedule. I should say, uh, it is not an easy schedule at all. This is a difficult, difficult schedule. They have got in their first, let's just, I mean, all the way up to November, guys. If you look from August 31st to November, they have got Penn State, who will be ranked. They are at Pitt, which is a rivalry game, and Pitt, I expect to be better than they were this past season. They have got Kansas, who we know is good. They have got Oklahoma State on the road, who we know is obviously in the Big 12 championship game this past season. They have got Iowa State at home. We know how good Iowa State is. They've got Kansas State. Good news, that one's also at home. They have also got at Arizona. So if you look at the, I mean, look at the win totals for these teams. They have got a 10-win team, a rivalry game on the road, a 9-win team, a 10-win team, an Iowa State team that was, what, 7-6 and six last year, but also, too, we know how good they are, a 9-win team in K-State, and a 10-win team in Arizona. They are playing a lot of winning football teams. The good news is, Only two of those winning teams come on the road. This is a very good home schedule for for, uh, West Virginia. At Pitt, at Oklahoma State, at Arizona, at Cincinnati, at Texas Tech. 
right? I mean, your hardest three road games are at Oklahoma State. It's going to be tough, but it's not like it's impossible. At Arizona, tough, not impossible. At Texas Tech, tough, but not impossible. If you win one of those three games, I think you'll be pleased. Now, the home slate is where, you know, okay, how many games can you get at home? You've got Penn State and Albany. Let's just go with a split there. Let's just say you lose to Penn State. Kansas, Iowa State, and K-State. If you can go two of three there, right? We're talking about a season, you know, we're going uh, on the road, counting the Cincinnati game. Let's just say you, you beat Cincinnati. Let's just say you go two and three on the road. Let's just say you beat Cincinnati and you beat Pitt. And uh, the other three games you, you drop. We're just, just going to do it like that. All right. So if you split these next one, I got you at two and four. So basically, I think seven and five, eight and four is what I'm looking at. Because you got all these, and it's, it's a lot of difficult games. That, that's what I'm looking at for West Virginia. It's just the challenge. I mean, even for them at home, look at the number of winning teams they have at home. Penn State, 10 win team. Kansas, once again, nine win team. Iowa State was a nine win, uh, seven win team. K State, nine win team. Baylor, not great. You're going to have to win that one. UCF also went, went to a bowl game last year. And hey, they could get better. KJ Jefferson comes in. We'll see. And we'll see what Gus Malzahn's got cooked up. But, you know, I, I think this is one of those teams where for West Virginia, you know, you have to think about, okay, will the record indicate improvement? This schedule is harder than last year's. So if West Virginia goes eight and five against this schedule, they might actually be a better team. They might be a better team than last year and perform a, like a better team from last year, but might not get the results of last year. Their schedule was advantageous in 2023. In 2024, once again, not like that. You are playing every team in the top part. I mean, let's go and look at the, if you go back and look at the Big 12 standings from last year and you look at who's towards the top, it's no longer in the league. You know, obviously like the, you know, take out the two teams that are no longer in the league. You play Oklahoma State. You play Iowa State. You play K-State. You can't play yourself. You play Texas Tech. You play Kansas, you play UCF. So every single bowl team in the league outside of OU in Texas, you play this season. Add Penn State into that and add Pitt, who once again is typically pretty good. That's why, hey, if they go eight and four, eight and five, it'd still be a successful year for Neil Brown because winning is not always linear, as I have mentioned. So a difficult schedule for West Virginia, but if you are a West Virginia fan, you got to like the fact that Penn State's coming to town, KU's coming to town, Iowa State's coming to town, K-State's coming to town. I mean, you've got some good teams rolling in there. Uh, you've got some good teams coming to you. And your schedule as a whole, I mean, it's going to be an entertaining schedule. Can they make it through that grind? Especially, I mean, you look at that October. Guys, that's a, that's a bear of an October. At Oklahoma State, Kansas, uh, Iowa State, excuse me, Kansas State, and at, at Arizona, that's a that's a that's a bear of a month. The good thing is, you know, you got back to back road games one time at Cincinnati, though. All right, let's go to the Kansas Jayhawks. So, what's exciting about KU's schedule this year is this: uh, they are going to be a globe trotting outfit. Their non conference home games are going to be at uh, at Ch Children's Mercy Park, which is in Kansas. Their home games in conference are going to be at Arrowhead Stadium, which is in Missouri. So they're going to play in Missouri. They're going to play in Kansas. They're going to play in Illinois. It's the third state. They're going to play in West Virginia. That's the fourth state. They're going to play in Arizona. That's the fifth state. They're going to play in um, they're already Kansas. They're going to play in Utah. That is the sixth state. They are going to play in Baylor, at Baylor. That is the seventh state. They are playing in seven different states. And, and get this, guys, they do not have, look at the schedule, they do not have consecutive games in the same stadium. They do not have that. They are in Missouri, uh, yeah, excuse me, in Kansas, then in Illinois. Back in Kansas to West Virginia. They play in Missouri. They're in, they're in the state of Arizona. They're in, uh, they're in uh, Missouri again. They are in Kansas. They're then back in Missouri. They're then going to go play in Utah. They're then back in Missouri. Then they're going to go play in Texas. So this team is going to be putting in that uh, those miles, getting those frequent flyer miles. These young men are, which obviously I think for the kids is you know somewhat exciting, but might just wear them down. This season is going to be a test for Lance Leipold. 
They will not have consecutive games in the same stadium. That is a challenge, in my opinion. Um, and I'm curious to see what wear down this group towards the end of the season. Right, well, all the different places and all the miles and everything. I think it'll wear down on them some weeks, but what we'll wear down on them in the end of the season, I don't, I you know, I think it's hard to say because on its surface, the schedule looks really good, right? Illinois is an average Big Ten team. It's a road game, though. UNLV was good last year. It's a home game, though, right? West Virginia on the road. We know it's going to be a tough game. And that's a rerun of the exciting 2022 game which saw JT Daniels get pick six by Jacoby Bryant to win the game. Then you've got TCU. We're not sure what to expect from them at a state. And you know, they're not very good, but they're going to be at home and they're trying to be improving Houston at home. feels like a game you should win. Then you've got sunflower showdown all the way in October. You've got Iowa state the next week. So like, it's, it's not like the schedule is, Oh my God, there is a grading part of the schedule. So what you have in terms of travel, ultimately, and look, we're going to break down the teams and talk about the teams more and more as we go along. This is, you know, we got all off season to do it. We're still the first week of February, right? So a breakdown of these teams and what they have. And also we don't even know what these teams are fully going to be, right? We've got another transfer portal window that is going to be coming our way. And because of that, we're not sure, you know, fully what these groups have just yet. Um, but that being said, you know, we know KU's got a good team. We know the schedule, man. Like there's not many situations where like they play UNLV in West Virginia. Those are two back-to-back -back bowl teams. They play K-State and Iowa State. Those are two back-to-back -back bowl teams. But let's see, Illinois last season went five and seven. So they play Lindenwood, <laughs> which they should win, obviously. Then they play a five and seven Big Ten team. They'll play a nine-win team in UNLV, but that game's going to be at home. A nine-win West Virginia team. But then they've got a five-win team, a three-win team, a four-win team, nine-win team, seven-win team, five-win team, four-win team, I believe, I forget, Colorado. And then a whatever Baylor was. Baylor ends up going three and nine. So, I mean, guys, this is not – now, look, these teams will improve and get better and fluctuate and go up and down. That's, that's what a lot of this league is going to be. But on its surface, the schedule is manageable. The travel of the schedule and the switching locations and, and you know, the kind of the, the grind on the kids, that is what I'm most intrigued about, right? That's what I'm most intrigued about because these, these guys will be traveling, man. There's, I mean, you, you give me that one stretch, like the, tra the travel in the beginning of the schedule here to uh, Lindenwood, to Illinois, and UNLV, that's not a ton of travel because Illinois isn't that too far away. It's not like you know, going crazy, crazy far. But when you go West Virginia, Back to, uh, you know, go, go playing uh, in KC, Missouri, then to Arizona, then back to KC. You know, that's that's a lot. Now, luckily, you're going to have KC, K-State, you know, back to KC again. So that kind of that difficult stretch. I mean, the, the hardest two games they have here tandem together are at K-State and Iowa State. That's the hardest two games they have. So luckily, the travel won't be too much for them on that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, manageable schedule. Travel is going to be ridiculous. All right, folks, let's talk some basketball from last night. Uh, so big result to me when you look at the Big 12 last night. They had the only ranked versus ranked matchup going on uh, yesterday evening, which was a lot of fun. Uh, that was between Baylor and Texas Tech. Fun scoring in that game. And Baylor really just ends up, you know, I, I think uh, the offensive effort in that second half, getting to the free throw line in that second half, uh, and also the amount, you know, they, they took care of a little bit better, better care of the ball last night and they out rebounded, uh, Texas tech. And I think, you know, an advantage for them that we're starting to see week in and day in and day out is, uh, Missy and Missy, I mean, as a freshman, you know, 17 points and seven rebounds, it started to be a bit more consistent and they've gotten inside presence, which they have not had in the past. And so on a night where, you know, Walter goes two for nine, like you can overcome that with some time from, uh, you know, with, with some inside pressure from uh, Missy. And the, the big night was uh, Ray J. Dennis, who scores 21 points, five assists, four steals. He was all over the place on the night. And Pop Isaac's rough shooting nights continue. But ultimately, to me, this game was uh, decided a bit in the paint and also to uh, a nice night at the free throw line, 75%, 24 of 32. That will play. 
Texas Tech only shot 16 free throws. A lot of time basketball, as I say this, is math. And so Baylor did a good job of getting the free throw line. And Massey, for a young guy, you know, goes seven for eight from the line. And you're seeing a guy that, you know, on the season, just a 56% free throw shooter. But when he gives you a seven for eight night and you've got the seven footer in there and he's working it like that, you're going to be in great shape. Scott Drew's team is in, is, you know, is improving shape. Now we'll see this weekend when they go down and they play the Kansas Jayhawks. We'll see what happens, or I guess up, you should say, and go play the Kansas Jayhawks at Allen Fieldhouse, college game day. But as for right now, the Baylor Bears are on a three game winning streak. They've won by eight, they've won by two, and they won by six. So they are, uh, they're starting to play well. They play a lot of close games, kind of just the way it is, a Baylor style. You know, wide open, spread it out. The defense is not excellent this year in the way it has been in the past. But but that being said, I think this team offensively, Missy adds a different dynamic, a different dimension to what they're doing on offense that we have not seen. And it's not really been a pounded inside team. They're able to be. Iowa State picks up a huge win on the road against Texas, 70 to 68. Iowa State is not just a good team. They could be a great team. I mean, you're seeing it with the defense now night in, night out. And, you know, this is a game where, Hey, like they did not shoot the ball from deep really well. 35% is fine. Um, but you know, what do you need to do on the road? Okay. Limit turnovers plus six in that category. They did not get out rebounded in this game. They had 10 steals too. They shot, they attempted 12 more shots, right? Pretty easy. Here's your, here's your basketball is math. All right. Texas shot 54 times and shot 41%. Iowa State shot the ball 66 times and shot the ball 41%. Well, what does that equate to? That's five more made baskets. Five more made baskets that they shot on the night, and that was a huge part. Now, Texas had a great night at the free throw line. They were 18 for 20. Iowa State was 10 of 13, but still, you're able to make up the difference in that spot. And they really also, too, managed a, you know, a great game from Dylan DeSue pretty well. But they get scoring off the bench, too. Uh, you know, I love what they get from Curtis Jones coming off there. Good to have guys guy who's experienced in age. This is one of those teams we mentioned, Kansas. They just have a tough time scoring off the bench. Iowa State, not that way. Last night, they had a really good night from the bench. They end up contributing 24 points out of the 70. And I know it's not a ton, but still a pretty meaningful amount of points on a night like this. So a good night from their bench. Uh, Jones was four of 10. Uh, Watson, one of one, three of four. Uh, you know, and, and then also Hassan Ward was two of four, too. So, I mean, your bench as a whole ends up shooting, let's see, six, four, 14. Uh, let's see, nine for 18 and then 10 for not yet. Yeah, 10 for 19 for your bench. Really good night from the bench production for Iowa state and TJ Otzelberger's group, man, they might lose some tough games. They lost a heartbreaker against Baylor, but you can tell they are a, I mean, they're impossible to beat at home and uh, on the road, they're starting to show some quality as well, which I think is really exciting for Iowa state fans. Cause they, they could be a final four team if they can win away from home where they play on the road. Oklahoma picks up a big, a big victory at home, 82 to 66. They were down early. They had a massive second half, which they, uh, you know, they rode to a victory, obviously honoring the man, Toby Keith, uh, you know, passed away sadly, but JV McCollum leads the way 20 points in this game. Uh, they shot 49% from the floor, a really strong game. there. only eight turnovers. Uh, that's huge. You're able to do that. And so I thought the, uh, the way they shot the basketball just overall, uh, was impressive in their second half defense. I thought was very impressive too. Uh, this was a 32 points for BYU, but still it felt like they had to work and work and their offense, obviously for Oklahoma, very explosive. So they get to 500 in the league, 17 and six, five and five overall. Porter Mosier is doing a really good job. Oklahoma very much on the right side of the bubble. They just need to keep this up if they want to stay on the right side of the bubble. And also one final game to mention here on a, uh, it was a Tuesday night. Houston 79, Oklahoma State 63. Kelvin Sampson just getting tossed in a game that wasn't very competitive. It was awesome to see. Uh, a little bit of fire. You know, they, they played pretty well after. They didn't get trounced by Kansas, but that was not a particularly close game in the end of the final score. So a great night from Jamal Shedd. He goes 8 for 12, 23 points, 4 assists, and 3 steals on the evening. They're able to get a lot of guys some action, and they shot the ball very well in this game, um, forcing 17 turnovers too on defense. All right, that will do it for today's show. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at NWPod365. You all can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore. You guys can find the show wherever you get your podcasts. You guys can also find us on YouTube as well. 
like the video, subscribe to the channel, all of those things. It's helpful when you all do. All right, folks, we'll talk at you next time.